Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, we're going to dive back into some Blue Jay today. Something a little different, something kind of off the walls, fun to do every so often. This one's called The Craziest Projects That Were Almost a Reality. I have no idea what he's going to talk about and therefore I have no idea how much I might know about any of those. So I'm ready to learn something today. I hope you are as well. I'll put the link down in the description so you can check out his video. I'll also put links to the other Blue Jay reactions that I have done in the past. I've done a couple of those. Uh, so you can check those out. They'll also be up on the screen at the end. Let's dive in. If humanity and suspended cartoon pianos have anything in common, is there an uncanny knack for failure time and time again? Whether it be a New Year's resolution or returning home with the milk, humans don't always accomplish everything they set out to do. But while these abandoned goals can leave weight sets dusty or children with lasting psychological damage, sometimes the goal itself is so ridiculous that it's probably best left in the good old idea box. And in a world where people thought hydrogen airships were a good idea, imagine the zany proposals that didn't make the cut. Now, So, you know, it, it's... So true when he showed the picture of the Hindenburg there. Um, it's so easy to look back on history and very often say, what were you thinking? But we have to put ourselves in the mindset of the time period and understand that they didn't always know everything that we know now. Sometimes they did, and they just chose to ignore it. Uh, that's definitely often the case. They didn't have safety procedures and uh, you know, organizations for regulation that we have today on some of this stuff uh, to prevent them from happening. Uh, but sometimes they did and they just ignored it. Now let's take a look at some of the crazy... Is that a flashback? Call, call, call. Tag is secured, extracting now. I've got your six. Ugh. The box, it's gone. Mother, they must have tracked our location. T Timmy, wh what are you doing on your phone? Uh, I'm just browsing iFunny. Okay, we need to talk about that later, but you're on public Wi-Fi. You should be using NordVPN to hide your location. Good transition. <sighs> that must be how they found us. Who's they? No time, we need that box. This looks like British equipment. Luckily, the UK is one of over 60 countries NordVPN has servers in. Use it to change our location to London. <laughs> okay, what now? Timmy, <laughs> they're Brits. <clears throat> How many miles is it to the royal palace? Actually, it's kilometers. You mean kilometers. In British defense, they do use miles, too, over there. They're one of those weird countries that mostly everything's metric, but they, they talk about miles. I think they understand miles. Right. Civilized people, people use kilometers, kilometers Jerry. Jerry. Surely, you mean there, go Timmy. <laughs> Anyway, NordVPN is a fantastic service that protects your personal information while going about online activities. And if you're hesitant, there's a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. Head on over to nordvpn.com slash bluejay or use code bluejay for a ridiculously huge discount. Thank you, NordVPN, for sponsoring the video. <laughs> oh, good. So as I was saying, let's take a look at some bonkers canceled projects. The people of 19th century London weren't all that different from us. They face similar day-to-day -day challenges that plague our lives today. But where we lose our keys, they lose their stable boy. Or instead of asking, where can I fit these groceries? They had, where can I fit these thousands of bodies? In the early 1800s, London was frantically searching for a solution for what to do with all their dead. Cemeteries were beginning to find themselves increasingly full. And seeing yeah. as how the residents weren't moving out, the lazy fucks, answers were desperately needed. And in 1820, architect Thomas Wilson came up with one such solution. Hey there, chap. That pyramid's rather neat, isn't it? <laughs> You know, and I want to pause before we get into what his solution was. Uh, by the 1820s, 1830s, you have to remember that um, in places like England, there were parish cemeteries. You know, everybody lived in a Church of England parish, whether you were a part of the Church of England or not. Uh, you lived in a parish, and your parish had a cemetery. And, and those parishes often had a lot more people than they had room for bodies. And so they would just reuse the cemeteries. I, I was just there last week, and uh, all of the cemeteries I visited where I had like ancestors who died and were buried even 150 years ago, they have no markers for their graves. Uh, and there are sometimes... Let me show you on a map what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is one of the cemeteries I visited. This is the Church of All Saints in West Bromwich. Uh, and there are probably two or three thousand grave markers in this cemetery. You can see about the size of it. You see what how big cars are, right? Uh, so there's that gives you a little bit of an example of how big uh, this cemetery is. And there's nobody in the center part. There's a cemetery right here, and then there's another part of it right there. Uh, here in the States, that's probably the spot where you've got about 3,000 people buried. From the records I've looked at, just going back to when they started doing records, 
there are something like forty to 50,000 people buried in this cemetery. Uh, there are probably five or six people in each spot where there's a grave. Um, and, and that was the case for cemeteries all over England. They were reusing and reusing and reusing these graves. Even today, you go there and you can go to some of the older cemeteries and you'll see a sign basically saying, hey, if you don't claim this grave of as a relative of this person who died 60 years ago, we're going to move the tombstone and we're going to reuse it. Um, so they started using private cemeteries about this time. What would make it better? Five million bodies. At the time, London was going through an Egyptian craze with artifacts pouring in from the land of the Nile, a topic that really deserves a video of its own. Influenced by this popularity, Thomas Wilson proposed the Metropolitan Sepulchre. This pyramid would have towered 94 stories on 18 acres of land, overlooking London on Primrose Hill, serving as a nice little reminder in the sky of your impending doom. You know, <laughs> in case the air wasn't enough. While most plans featured in this video are rather ridiculous, the Death Pyramid actually wasn't that crazy of an idea. With a capacity of 5 million, it would have stored an equivalent of 1,000 acres of traditional cemetery land. To add to its practicality, the summit was to be used as an astronomical observatory because all the best research is fueled by the screams of the damned. And what did Wilson plan to do if the pyramid got full? Psh, build a new one. Giza got three. But like all fun things in life, public opinion saw the downfall of the death pyramid. This could have something to do with the fact that Wilson claimed, it will teach the living to die and the dying to live forever. But I think Industrial Revolution London already had that lesson down. For <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. And if you go to Paris, they've got the catacombs, right? Where they chose to put them all underground. Uh, so this is always a problem in big cities with very densely populated areas. Furthermore, there were concerns that the sheer weight of the thing would literally crush Primrose Hill. We all know how Londoners like their curves. Ultimately, people preferred a wild and free Primrose Hill, with the opening of multiple garden cemeteries on London's countryside being the final nail in the coffin. <laughs> So unfortunately, the Park Cemetery beat out the Death Pyramid as the go-to burial method. And here in the U.S., they started making those too, but primarily most of our cemeteries would fall into that Park Cemetery category. We have cemeteries in church, uh, in and around churches, but most of our cemeteries aren't. Could you imagine? Mother, I miss Grandpappy. Don't you worry, James. Your grandfather will always be watching over you. In the modern era, many strides have been made towards improving the lives and rights of the LGBT community, resulting in more acceptance of homosexuality in today's culture than ever before. And as with all things, this left the US government with one pressing question, mm -hmm, but can we weaponize it? In 1994, researchers at Air Force's Wright Laboratory in Ohio set up to do just that, exploring the potential for a gay bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no, not the fun kind. We're talking psychochemical warfare. In a three-page proposal to the Department of Defense, they described how the bomb would disperse a gas over enemy camps that would, quote, cause enemy soldiers to become gay and to have their units break down because all their soldiers became irresistibly attractive to one another. Basically, the idea was to help the enemy combatants make love, not war. So, basically the idea was to hit them with some kind of pheromone, I guess, that would cause them to not be able to focus on what they were supposed to be doing. The principle behind it, I guess, makes sense. But when you spin it this way, which is still true, so we can make war. The document acknowledged that no such chemical existed at that point, but promised further research into the little explored world of pheromones and aphrodisiacs should their $7.5 million proposal get approved. The basis for the idea seems to have originated from how copulants were marketed as aphrodisiacs in perfumes and cologne since the 70s. But that remains more in the realm of pseudoscience, seeing as how the claim was based on just some observations of monkey behavior, not quite the definition of a serious or controlled scientific study. Regardless, the proposal made its way to the Pentagon, and I like to imagine it went a little something like this. Okay, Corporal, what do you got for me? Proposal for a new nuclear warhead that maximizes radiation damage to farmland. About time, push it forward. The army wants to weaponize honeybees in Iraq, so they- Yeah, yeah, sure, fine. Wright Laboratory gave us this proposal for a gay bomb that- <gasps> Corporal, are you mad? We are the United States of America, for Christ's sake. It is our duty, as the leaders of the free world, to draw the line on what is just and inhumane. Understood, Major, consider it scrapped. <laughs> <clears throat> the FBI think they can overthrow Castro using child sleeper agents and doped up spinner dolphins. How fast can they have it done? The Department of Defense scrapped the proposal pretty quickly, and the gay bomb never saw any real development. But I mean, come on, the idea was pretty ridiculous. So my curiosity is piqued in terms of how did we find out about this, right? Like, because this is obviously something that somebody must have leaked or somebody got access to by a Freedom of Information Act request or something. 
because it wasn't that long ago. So how do we find out that this was something that was being studied? Somebody had to say something. If you have any idea, let me know in the comment section. There's nothing that can just turn any man gay. It's the early 1920s, and America's having a roaring time. They got jazz, that one Fortnite dance, and a stock market that could never get depressing. The Great War may be over, but a great age has just begun. Right, Europe? Oh, right, the war happened. Oh, that's... That's actually Ypres. That's from an actual image of the town of Ypres. That's the cloth hall on the right. It's the cathedral on the left. That's actually pretty cool. And here. Spare any change? Ew. Unlike the US, the years immediately following World War I didn't prove fruitful for much of Europe. The continent was experiencing a sharp rise in unemployment, overpopulation, and a looming energy crisis. Noting these issues, German architect Hermann Zorgel sought to kill multiple government drones with one stone, using his continent uniting project, Atlantropa. Now, I am curious about the overpopulation part. Europe had much less population than it has today. Um. And I've been to Europe. I mean, there's huge chunks of it where there's just nothing there. So it's not like they're on top of each other, right? I mean, just in the big cities, maybe. But um, they had just lost 17 million people in the First World War. So I feel like overpopulation maybe wasn't the issue they're making it out to be. I know what you're thinking. And no, unfortunately, Atlantropro wasn't a plan for a massive Atlantis-themed water park. In fact, quite the opposite. Instead of a large influx of water, the project called for the draining of water. A lot of water like a sea's worth. Specifically, Zorgel wanted to partially drain the Mediterranean Sea yep. by building a series of this. dams. The Mediterranean is naturally evaporative, with water flowing in from the Atlantic. A dam across the Strait of Gibraltar would naturally lower the sea level over time, and Zorgel planned to drop it by up to 200 meters, creating over 660,000 square kilometers of new land for living space. Europe and Africa would unite into a new supercontinent, with all its energy needs being met by the new dam, hmm. the construction of which would provide the unemployed masses with work for decades. Decades. That is not the worst idea I've ever heard, right? I mean, I don't know how practical it was, and I don't know what the negatives would have been. Maybe they'll describe that. The plan initially saw a lot of support from the German public, but not so much so from countries actually on the Mediterranean. This could have something to do with the fact that the fishing villages weren't all that keen on becoming mountain ones, and places yeah. like Venice would pretty much lose their entire identity. But come on, ocean views are overrated. Things are great in Germany. Africa wasn't a fan either. Something about giving Europeans easier access to their lands didn't quite sit right with them, but their opinion mattered about as much as a post on Apple's feedback page. Yeah, basically we'd merge together as one continent, and we could build railroads to you guys, making travel extremely convenient. Convenient. What do you think? I know, great, right? Say how much? Yeah, I mean, in the aftermath of World War One, we are well into the time when Europe has colonized a lot of Africa. So you can understand why folks in Africa would not be too keen on making it easier for the European nations to quickly transport equipment and troops and things like that to Africa. How much concrete do you have? Zorgel later pitched the project to the Nazis after they took over, noting their desire for living space, but they weren't all that interested in the plan. Ah, damn, why bother creating new land when there is all this land nobody is using? What? Of course, Atlantropa had a few small issues that needed some ironing out, such as catastrophic effects on climate, the mass extinction of Mediterranean marine life, and the lack of enough concrete in the world at the time to actually construct the thing. Oh, and there's a small fact that the homes of millions and the power of an entire continent were solely subject to the proper operation of a single dam holding back a literal ocean. Can you imagine the catastrophe if the squirrel from Ice Age stumbled upon it? Zorgo continued to promote point. his project until his death in 1952, with his beloved Atlantropa losing all its steam with him. But hey, now that the name is open for the Taking. I say we try that water park idea. I actually went ahead and took a crack at the design. It's themed after the movie Atlantis The Lost Empire, which features dynamite wielding Italians, making it objectively the best animated Disney movie. I'm thinking we can build a thing in Poland because god knows they deserve a break. If a colossal water park can't line up a place that depressing, I don't know what will. Perhaps a gay bomb. Yeah, it tends to Hey, I love Poland. Poland's got a lot of great history. Let's not be mean to Poland. Stars. All right, so I'm going to throw up some links to some videos, uh, some other videos of his that I've done. They're also down in the description. Definitely check out Blue Jay. He's got, you can see he's got a very interesting style. It's similar to uh, like Salmonella, things like that. And I think he does a great job with it. So definitely check him out. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.